Okay, this is the last section for chapter 2.1 um, for STEM biology. Um, the next thing we're going to do is Bohr diagrams. This is a picture representation of an atom. You're going to be drawing these things out. They show information about the nucleus, and what we know so far about the nucleus is that there's protons and neutrons in there. Um, they also show electron energy levels. Okay, so this is how you draw Bohr models. Here's a step-by-step kind of description. Um, the first thing you're going to do is draw a small circle that's going to represent the nucleus. And inside the circle, you're going to write the element symbol that you are drawing the Bohr model for. And then give me the number of protons and neutrons that are inside the nucleus. Next thing you're going to do is look up what period, which is the row, that the element is in. And then whatever that period number is, you're going to draw that many circles around your smaller circle. That's going to represent your orbitals. You're going to add electrons as small dots to each circle that is allowed, remembering the rule from the chart from podcast part one, until you have the proper number of electrons that that um, element has. Remember, your number of electrons should equal the number of protons. All right, so here is the Bohr model for carbon-12. So how would we write that? First step is to draw a small circle. Okay, that's going to represent our nucleus. And then inside the circle, you're going to put the symbol, which is carbon, and the number of protons and neutrons. Carbon off the periodic table is number six, so you will have six protons and six electrons. I'm sorry, neutrons. Protons, remember the symbol is P plus equals six, and neutrons are going to equal six. You know the number of neutrons because it is carbon 12. 12 minus six is six. Then if you look on your periodic table, you will find it is in row 2 or period 2, and so you will draw two circles around your nucleus. These are representing the orbitals. So then you need to figure out, well, how many electrons does carbon have? Electrons equal protons. So if you have six protons, you need six electrons. So how many can fit on this first energy level? If you have your chart and your notes in, the, in front of you, it has the maximum number of only two electrons, and so then you would put your next four, because you have six total to draw, on the outside circle. Remember, on the outside circle, atoms would love to have eight to be happy, to be full, to have all their um, valence electrons, which, um, and carbon only has four, so carbon is very reactive. It would like, it could um, bond with lots of many different things, and we'll get into that later on in this course. Okay, the one term I just said was valence electrons. Um, valence electrons are defined as the electrons that are in the outermost energy level. So for carbon, there are four valence electrons. There is an exception with the transition metals, which are the middle section of the periodic table. Okay, another thing that you need to be able to do are, is make Lewis dot diagrams. These are dots, and the dots that you're going to use represent the valence electrons. How many are in that outer shell? Um, remember, valence electrons are the electrons in the outer level. How many valence electrons does sodium have? So what you're going to do is go to your periodic table and look up the group. Sodium is in the first group, so sodium has one dot, and you would draw it as so. You would write the symbol for sodium, and then you would draw one dot. You can fit up to eight dots around an um, element. Um, because that is the most that they would have in their outer shell. You can't have more than eight. Okay? All right, so what group is chlorine located? You look on your periodic table, you should see that it is located in the 17th co um, column or group. So we have 17 electrons. How many electrons in, are in chlorine's outer level? You have to draw it to figure it out. And if you draw it out, you will see that there are seven. So when you're figuring out the group for the, when it's higher up in the, um, for the group uh, period, 17, you would just subtract 10. So it has seven valence electrons, not 17. Okay? So you just subtract the 10. So then you would draw seven dots around chlorine with the symbol. And so chlorine would love to get one more electron there. So it is reactive. All right, so sodium had one dot and chlorine has seven dots. These Lewis dot diagrams are useful to show how chemical reactions occur. For example, sodium has one, 
valence electron, chlorine has seven valence electrons. Sodium would love to get rid of this, so sodium will give chlorine its electron, forming a chemical bond and forming table salt. All right, a, couple, a little bit of review from physical science um, that you guys did not take. A chemical formula shows the elements that are in a compound, and it also shows the number of atoms of each element in the compound. So, for example, H2O is a compound. It is made up of more than one element. If you're looking at these numbers, the 2 is for the hydrogen and there is no number next to the O which you assume then that there is a really, really a 1 there but you don't write it out. So the 2 represents that there are two hydrogen atoms and the 1 represents, that's blank, that's invisible, represents that there is one oxygen atom. So that is what a, a compound of water looks like. Two hydrogens and one oxygen. Chemical bonds are strong attractive force between atoms or ions in a molecule or a compound. Remember an ion is a charged particle, either positive or negative. Chemical bonds are formed by either transferring electrons, meaning that they either lost or gained an electron, or by sharing their electron. Um, there is an octet rule. Most atoms will form bonds in order to have eight valence electrons, which we talked about earlier. They want to have a full outer energy level. An example of this are the noble gases. They're on the very far right of your periodic table. And so example is neon. And if you can see, neon has eight valence electrons. It is stable and very and unreactive. Stability is the driving force behind how bonds work. So if I give you this chart and you look at their Bohr diagrams, which atoms are more likely to gain an electron? Okay, so if you look at lithium and sodium, they only have one valence electron in their outer shell. So they're not going to, it's really unlikely that they're going to gain seven more. They're more likely to lose that one electron. Where the ones on the right side, like fluorine and chlorine, have seven valence electrons in their outer shell, so they are more likely to gain an electron in order to become stable. So there's your list of gaining and losing from the diagram before. Okay, so in order to gain stability, atoms will either transfer their electrons, like sodium and chlorine, to make sodium chloride, and that forms a chemical bond. If sodium loses an electron, you're losing its negative, so it becomes a positive. Chlorine gained an electron, so it gained a negative charge, so now it has a negative charge overall. The positive and the negative cancel each other out to form the compound. The other way that atoms um, become stable is by sharing electrons. Chlorine atom has seven valence electrons. They will share these two electrons together and form a bond, for example, a chlorine molecule. Okay, so going back, ions are charged particles that have lost or gained an electron. If the ion lost an electron, it is called a cation, and if you lose a negative, then you become positive, and an example of that is potassium. If you gain an electron, you are gaining a negative charge, and you are called an anion. And an example of that is iodine. So here's another example here of potassium giving its electron to iodine because potassium lost that electron. It is now called a cation, K+, plus, has a positive charge, where iodine gained an electron and now has a negative charge. Okay, think about it. Each electron has a charge of negative one. If you add one electron to an atom that was neutral, it would be zero plus minus one, which is negative one. If you add two electrons, it would be minus two. If you subtract a charge of minus one, zero minus minus one, if you do the math, it would be a plus one. You're taking away the negative charge. Okay, so the two types 
of reactions or bonds that can be made. The first one is an ionic bond, and that's one I already described for you. An ionic bond is an attraction between two oppositely charged ions. Transfer of electrons are taking place. One atom is giving its electrons to another. Okay. When an ionic bond forms, it forms a compound, and the compound will now have a neutral charge. Remember, the sum of the charges will equal zero, and it's neutral. That's the example I showed you. Four ionic bonds, they usually form between metals and nonmetals off your periodic table, which are usually the elements that are across the table from each other. The other one was the covalent bond that I showed you earlier. Some atoms are unlikely to lose or gain electrons and they will share electrons. This happens between two nonmetals. When that happens, the product would be a molecule. Covalent bonds only form between non-metallic elements, which are on the right side of the table, bonded together. Okay, and there's an example. These two would come together and share that electron, and then they both would be stable. That is a covalent bond. And that ends our podcast for Chapter 2.1.